Good afternoon, folks. I'm the Complex Games Apologist. Today we're going to be covering in depth the man to man or personal or sentient to sentient scale of combat in Star Trek Adventures. This is a big video. It's going to have a lot of different sections because a lot of things are different than your prior assumptions or experiences with combat systems in Star Trek Adventures. So this is the outline right here about what we're going to cover and if you have any specific questions about a different part of it or you're looking to jump to a specific answer that you might have on your mind then I'm going to label this in the final edit. This is a big thing so let's get into it. It's not particularly complicated but each of these sections are different than what you may have experienced before. So let's get into it. It's a little bit of a different system. There's of course rounds and turns and the things that we're normally used to. Each character takes a turn and then a different character takes a turn until everyone's taken a turn and then we go back around. But there's a little bit of a wibbly wobbly timey wimey sauce to how each of these turns and rounds are composed and it's unique. So we're going to delve into these rules a little bit at a time. The first place that I'm going to talk about them is with regard to initiative, or who goes first. So there's a rubric for how this works. First of all, unless there's a good reason for NPCs to act first in a combat, a player character will act first. What player character that is might be obvious based on what they were doing before. If someone notices that an ambush is about to unfold, then it may be to them as the security officer who is alert to that ambush to go first, just obviously. If a captain gives an order to open fire because negotiations have gone sour, then it's likely the captain's turn to go. But if there's any doubt, or if several characters could legitimately act first, then the character with the highest daring will act first. Then afterwards, someone from the opposing force will go, and back and forth until everyone has gone, with any leftover or kind of extra numbers of characters on one side or another going one at a time at the end of the round. Now if it's obvious that NPCs act first, then of course they do, followed by player characters in turn. And if there's any doubt, then the Game Master can spend a threat to have the NPCs go first. If there's, you know, if you're not feeling sure in your mind or if the players feel that perhaps they maybe have some doubts in their mind, then that threat spend is, is a way to put that at ease. And that's written into the rules too. An important thing to note is that after this determination of who goes first at the very beginning of combat, it's the choice of the side collectively about who among them is going to go. So as the turn comes back to your away team, the player character party, then someone will choose to go, or seize the reins and go. Now this I go, you go flow is disrupted in a couple of ways which I think are important to how combats will unfold. The first is with retain initiative, a two cost momentum spend, which is immediate, meaning you can purchase it by adding to threat. And this allows another character on your side to go before trading back to the enemy. You can only do it once before the enemy gets to take at least one turn. But this can allow two characters to act in concert. You may find that this sort of thing is appropriate to the situation pretty often, and there's a number of player character talents which bring the cost down, and I think that those are pretty valuable, in fact. So once it's a player character's turn, what do they have before them? What's the action economy, as we call it in other games? Well, you have one task, and then you have one minor action for free. And you can reach beyond that by a number of spends, which are immediate. The tasks are a menu of options, which we'll go through. Of course, attacking and defending and the like are high on that list. But there's a number of other really good options. Now, you can take a second task on your turn. It's uh, called Swift Task. It's two momentum and allows you to take a second task which is at plus one difficulty. This is also possible through a determination spend called Surge of Activity. And in that case, the second task isn't increased in difficulty, which means that you could build up a lot of momentum on the first one and then spend it all in the second. And this, I think, is one of the places where how much space and time a turn takes up 
needs to be thought of as flexible because you can sprint across the room and taking a couple of risks, maybe running across open country or shoving some people out of your way who may be angry about it. In other words, increasing threat. You could get into a flanking position for a later phaser shot. An important thing to note about these swift tasks, or surges of activity, is that everyone has a two task per round limit. And that's regardless of where you're getting these from. And there's one other source that we'll talk about later where a character could take another task. But that's only up to that limit of two tasks. So let's talk about the minor actions that you have available to you on your turn. You can move out to medium range, which is something like the inside of the zone that you're in or to an adjacent zone. And we'll cover what zones are, but they're essentially kind of narrative divisions within the battlefield, and they're not necessarily the sort of thing that you have to get out a map and minis for. Another important minor action is to interact, something like opening a door that requires touching the keypad, using your comm badge to communicate, uh, possibly, you know, waving your tricorder around to search for a hidden enemy, any of these devices, the interact action includes the use of the device after you've turned it on, so long as it doesn't include a task. An important and really inexpensive minor action for combat is aim, which allows you to reroll one of your dice going into either of hand-to-hand -hand combat or ranged combat. And because dice are increasingly expensive, in Star Trek Adventures as you roll those tasks. This is a very cheap way getting more success on those attack rolls. Now there are other minor actions on the menu and I will cover them as we get to relevant points within this video, but I think it's important to point out that you can purchase more minor actions than the one that you get for free by spending a momentum, which is an immediate spend, adding to threat. And this is important to this feeling that each turn is a little bit wibbly-wobbly and timely wimey It's about how much stress and concentration and risk and leaning on your teammates is possible within a given round, the entire space of time, and then the more rubbery space inside of it, which is when you're going to take your turn. So before we move on to talk about the different menu of tasks and options that you have on your turn, which includes, of course, attacking, let's talk about what the map or the theater of the mind, the space that the characters are existing in. It's not a strict grid like this. The zones are meant to be a narrative space. One room might be one zone and another room might be just through the doorway into the next room. There's a ladder of ranges and I would approach this from the idea of what range am I at relative to another thing? And then from there, I might draw zones on a map, either conceptually in the theater of the mind or on a map, hopefully in the moment or possibly prepared in Roll20. I'll show you a couple of maps that I've done, one from a module and another one from my game that I've run. The first range band to talk about is Reach. It's anyone that you can hand a device to that you're nearby. It's anyone that you could get into a hand-to-hand -hand combat exchange with. It's descriptive. I can be in reach of a Klingon and in reach of one of my teammates, but the teammate isn't necessarily also in reach of the Klingon. This sounds complicated, but it isn't because generally each character keeps track of things. This is a place where tokens might come into play just to talk about who's engaged and who isn't. But moving beyond this range band, I think you'll find that it becomes less and less necessary to keep strict observance to a combat map and the like. An important thing to note before we move on to other range bands is that you can move into reach of cover. And, and, and this cover will provide you some protection versus ranged attacks or even hand-to-hand -hand attacks. The next range band is close range, and this is where it's more difficult to make a ranged attack because things are very close by and you, you might be waving your phaser around trying to acquire a target. So medium range is that space that's apart from the space that you're in. It's something probably logically divides it from where you are right now, the close space. 
Uh, and and this is this is sort of the thing where it's like uh, around the corner in the cargo bay or up on the dais of the transporter room versus below or you know behind the big wooden console on the galaxy class bridge versus below the wooden console you know near the captain's chair and so on these are some examples of what would divide one zone from another and you'll find descriptively that that probably means you can just say you're at medium range just thinking about that that question and answer within your mind and now long range is two zones away that could be that you are looking into a shuttle bay from the doorway and crouched behind a shuttle or crouched up on one of the control balconies is someone who's you know waiting with a phaser that could be long range because there's two kind of notional divisions between the two of you again you can use maps and you can draw them if this sounds complicated but I find that in play it's it's pretty easy to just figure out what the range between two combatants is either on the fly or just kind of using a back of your mind kind of scratch pad so one last thing to cover before we can start moving into how attacks and other combat tasks are done is to talk about what it means for a character to be injured what does being hurt mean in this game now we roll for damage when we make a successful attack and that's done with the challenge dice which are a part of this game and to give you a sense of those each die has two faces that are a zero two faces that are one plus effect one that's a one and one that's a two and so this averages out to about one on each die you get however many dice from the weapon which can be between three and five and then one die for each point in your security discipline that you have as a character. So, let's put that into context. You have a number of hit points or stress points equal to your character's fitness plus their security discipline. Now here's where things get interesting. Your character is either up and running and able to fight, subject to any complications that they may be suffering from, which could include things like a sprained ankle or a punch to the jaw, or they're injured and they're not able to participate in the battle any longer. So how do you become injured? So there's two ways that taking damage can lead to your character entering this injured state. The first way, over here in column A, is if you take five damage from an attack after cover and resistance from your armor and so on. The second way is if you fall down to zero stress. And so you could take two injuries at once feasibly. And we'll talk about what that means in just a second. It is a little interesting. Now, if you were already at zero, then any amount of damage is an injury. So that would be a column B. So if you took any damage while you were already at zero and five, that would be two injuries. So it's interesting to contemplate, and I haven't seen it yet, but a character that's down at zero stress could be still walking around and would have that looming over them. Now that may provide an interesting answer to the question of why characters wouldn't avoid injury. Now this is the next important ingredient of how combat in Star Trek Adventures works. When you've got either of these column A or column B situations that your character is facing, you need to decide if you're going to avoid the injury or let it happen. If you don't avoid the injury, then you fall down. Now if you do, that's a two momentum spend, which is immediate, and you can do it by adding to threat. You can also avoid an injury by accepting a complication, which could be a minor injury, like being shot in the arm, which would affect the difficulty of later actions. It could be that you got out of the way of the attack and a bystander behind you was hit, or that possibly a piece of your equipment was shot out of your hand. Those could all be ways for you to avoid an injury, but regardless of how you avoid an injury, in a given combat, you can only avoid injury once. Now there is a way to restore that ability, which we'll talk about in just a little while. So the next thing to talk about are lethal injuries versus non-lethal injuries. And this has to do with what's gonna happen to your character after they've been injured. Unlike some other games where lethal damage and non-lethal damage is tracked separately, lethal and non-lethal is just a decision that the person making an attack makes in the moment set for stun or set to kill. 
And the damage which gets applied to your character one way or another, if it satisfies the conditions we talked about earlier, column A and column B, then it'll cause either a lethal or non-lethal injury based on that choice that they made. So an important distinction from previous games that you may have played. I'm not going to confuse it any further, just remind you that the distinction between lethal and non-lethal is strictly a matter for the attack that's being made right now. So let's talk about the situations where a character might take two injuries at once, or where they may take an injury while they've already been injured, while they're lying down on the ground. So if the first injury was non-lethal, then any kind of second injury, lethal or non-lethal, will turn that into a lethal injury state. If a character has already been lethally injured and takes a second lethal injury, then that means they die. So if you're taking two lethal injuries at once, you need to avoid one or you die. This sounds a little bit more complicated than it is. The important thing to note is just what type of injury tag is the character taking around with them. And so now we come to the distinction between a lethal and a non-lethal injury. Non-lethal injuries, after the combat scene is over with, your character gets up, they may have a complication on them or the like as they recover from their injury, but they'll be fine. Meanwhile, a lethal injury is the sort of thing that your character will die from at the end of a scene if they're not attended to. Now before a person gets panicked, there is some fairly stern guidance to the game master not to avoid a scene before characters have had a chance to try and resolve some of that lethal injury. Now of course that doesn't do a great deal for those characters that die instantly from two lethal injuries at once. So that's the grim consequences of an injury. Now let's talk about the different ways that you can exist in the combat space, including attacks, which we'll cover first. The kind of attack that we see most often made by our protagonists on more contemporary Star Trek shows is a shot with a hand phaser. So let's talk through how to make a ranged attack first. It's a difficulty two task using control plus security to get your target number. You can only attack targets which you can see. And this is an important thing to note because range categories don't actually affect your difficulty in this game. They only affect the possibility of you spotting an enemy, which could become a task as the difficulty of seeing folks becomes more and more difficult at longer range increments. Next, you designate whether your attack is lethal or non-lethal. It's just a matter of setting for stun or to kill. This has nothing to do with the charge properties of hand phasers, which can overlap and be used with either category of lethal or non-lethal attacks. If you're making a lethal attack, you have to add one threat to the pool. And this represents the idea that on Star Trek, punching above the belt is encouraged, and punching below the belt is the sort of thing which escalates conflicts and leads them to spiral out of control. Likewise, a Game Master character, if making a lethal attack, will need to expend one threat out of the pool. That's the way anything that says threat on the Game Master side works in a mirror image. But just to clarify, because this is a question I've heard on a number of occasions. An important thing to note here is the Create Problem Momentum Spend, which is immediate and costs two, which the target could spend to increase the difficulty of your shot. This could be a matter of suppressive fire or tumbling out of the way in a very classic fashion, which we know some characters are wont to do. And so this is one way that shooting a phaser can become something defensive and interactive. Next, if you meet or exceed the difficulty, you roll your challenge dice pool for your attack, and your opponent rolls whatever cover dice they have available. An important note is that dropping prone at medium range and longer can allow someone to re-roll their cover dice. And the same way that all re-rolls work in Star Trek Adventures, they can scoop some of them, but keep others. However, once an attacker is at close range, instead of any benefit, the attacker gets two bonus momentum over and atop whatever they earn on their attack when they're hitting a prone character at close range. Now once damage is rolled, just like any other task, before it's fully resolved, you can spend momentum to interact with the task results. 
This could be a matter of a piercing spend of momentum to shoot through or around the cover. It could be a matter of re-rolling some of your damage dice as you refine the shot, as you track the beam or double tap in order to get a more successful strike. And now, after all is said and done here, now we do the same calculations that we spoke about earlier when taking damage to your stress, and you take one injury or two injuries which you resolve one at a time in the way that we just talked about. One more thing to note before we move on to hand-to-hand -to -hand attacks is that if anyone, an enemy, is right there within reach, then your ranged attacks are at plus one difficulty. So in a situation like that, you may find yourself wanting to make a hand-to-hand -hand or melee attack. So let's talk about how those are done. First of all, if it's your turn and you're the one attacking, you decide what weapon you want to use, you decide whom you want to attack, which has to be someone within reach, and you decide if it's a lethal or a non-lethal attack, and you obey the same conditions that we talked about a moment ago. Next, each side establishes their difficulty. It's an opposed task here. And so each side begins with a difficulty of one, and create problem could come into the mix here. That's something to note. Next, each side decides how many opportunities they want to create, which is to say, how many dice they want to buy on the opposed task. Then we roll the dice, and we calculate how many successes in excess of the baseline one each side gets. The person with the most momentum is the winner and gets to choose what they want to do, which could be damage. In the case of a tie, the active character, the person whose turn it is, wins the tie, and they become the successful attacker. Now, I did mention that it's an opposed task. Even if it's not your turn, if you do win the contest, then you are the successful melee attacker. And so you now get to make one of these choices. You can start into a grapple. You can shove the opponent out of the way, rolling your unarmed strike damage, but only to knock them down. You can disengage from the melee state entirely, moving to close range, anywhere within the same zone, but out of reach of the person that you were just fighting with. And of course, you can do damage with your weapon, as the last option on that list. And just like with ranged attacks, cover may come into play, armor certainly will if you're fighting a Borg or a Klingon, and then the calculations of if there's an injury and any momentum spends to try and get up to that rung on the ladder will take place. So let's talk about the other things that you can do in combat, because after all, this is a Star Trek role-playing game, and there's lots of approaches to a crisis situation like this which aren't necessarily violent. The first one to talk about is Guard, which is the basic defensive action. At a difficulty of zero, it increases any attack against you, by one, which is pretty valuable, and it also has a difficulty zero task. It has the potential to earn enough momentum to either create a retain initiative for a friendly to go next, or to do a swift task for yourself. An interesting and fun narrative potential here, a way to roleplay your character, is that the attribute and discipline for a guard action vary. So it could be that with your scientific mind, you're able to analyze the opponents, their tactics, their biology, the danger of this creature. It could be that your knowledge of Klingon psychology with your command discipline could be informing how it is that you're taking this defensive posture. So the next really basic action that you can take on your turn is to move or to sprint. This starts out at difficulty zero, but if you don't want to make a melee attack and you are in reach of an opponent, then making this, like anything else, will be increased in difficulty by one. Each momentum that you spend is another zone moved. And this, like guard, is another way that you might get enough to have a retain so that a fellow character can move, or it could be another way to do a swift task. And the way that this is visualized in the mind's eye is a lot of fun because this means that you can kind of visualize getting into a flanking position. It can be a matter of you distracting the opponents or that your side is making a break for it together. And that's what that momentum that you pass on to your friend for retain means. Now this could sound pretty costly to do on your turn, but there are a lot of really fun talents that make this more valuable, which is to assist with your task on your turn. 
This will only chip in a die to someone else's task, but this can be really useful and it's really the only option for supporting characters if they are the secondary. If you're here and also a red shirt is here that you're also playing, then he is gonna join in and shoot his phaser next to you as an assist. Next is something which applies all across the board in Star Trek Adventures to every kind of situation, which is to create an advantage. It's always difficulty two, and it's the sort of thing that can reduce other folks' difficulties or make special tasks possible. This could be pointing out a weak spot in the opponents, this could be creating a tactical plan to volley the opponents with your phaser fire, and all of these things could be reducing difficulty. It's a matter of using your brain cells and your creativity and imagination to come up with how these things work. Needless to say, I think it's a useful way to spend your turn, especially if you think this is going to be a protracted encounter or it's one where you're really trying to avoid any sort of outbreak of violence. The next combat action to talk about is recover. This is how you get back your ability to avoid an injury. Remember we talked about that a little bit earlier during avoid injury. It's difficulty two using fitness plus command. Now it does go down to one if you're in cover, and here's where it gets interesting, because any of your cover dice, when you roll effects, will provide an additional one resistance. So it really does beef up your standing in the fight if you do take a moment to step back and pull yourself back together. On top of that, you can spend momentum to actually regain stress or hit points, and you get two stress back for every momentum spent on this recover task. So that's how you help yourself when you're feeling down. But there's also a first aid task, which is using daring plus medicine. It starts out at difficulty one, and this just makes it so that if someone has been lethally injured, they're not gonna die. You can spend two momentum on top of that to bring them back into the fight and essentially lift the injured condition off of them. Now, while not every character is a medic, only one or two of them are likely in a position of command. And a captain or a first officer can use the direct task. And of course, NPCs in a similar position can do so too. This takes your turn, your task on your turn, and gives it to someone else, and essentially pulls them out of the stream of initiative and says, you do this right now and also they get an assist from you as you're doing it. You might notice this is a very similar to a concept, the executive order card from the Battlestar Galactica board game, which I'm a bit of a fan of, uh, but this may just be an obscure reference. But it's very useful, and it's something which can really accelerate the pace of things. Keep in mind there is that strict two-task throughout the round limit for every character. And this applies to that, and that applies to this. Now to finally round things out, you can pass on your turn. If you don't take any minor actions, you can delay your initiative to later in the round. This can be another way to act in concert, as long as the team feels comfortable with waiting on it. You can also ready a task. You can state a condition, you state what you're going to do if the condition happens, and then you interrupt the flow of initiative in the middle of someone else's turn to do whatever it is you said you were going to do. This is a lot like the ready action from 3.x D&D. So there you have it folks, that's the landscape of options and the basic walkthrough of how to get yourself through a combat in Star Trek Adventures. There's a really rich tactical landscape which I hope to go into in a future video, but just to give you a couple samplings and tidbits, one of the things is you can use a minor action to move up into reach of an opponent and then simply make a guard action, or on guard as I like to call it. This is something which I love for Klingons to do and it really spices things up as I'm playing an NPC when I'm the game master. Also could be a very valuable thing when you're a security officer. Seems like the sort of thing Worf would do to get up in someone's personal space and say, mm -mm 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 -mm, while also generating a smidge of momentum for his teammates coming up. The next thing that I've seen that's really fun is the cocksure and really accurate snipe of a phaser shot from a really confident Starfleet officer. It's a matter of setting up all the different minor actions that they need to make it happen.
The charge action allows you to pick a number of different abilities for your phasers when you fire them. Next, take another minor action to aim. Possibly take a third minor action to move to some place where you're in cover. Then, make your attack and hopefully you're going to be able to hit an area of opponents. This is the sort of thing, especially with the determination spend, can end a combat just as it begins. It's really fun, anticlimactic, costly, and dangerous. And of course, it's subject to the whim of the dice. So a lot of the fun dimensions of 2 die 20 system, the pendulum mechanic of momentum and threat, as people call it, it really comes alive in combat. There are minor combats. I've started combats with only four threat in the pool as the game master, and those NPCs, they're not long for this world, or at least they're going to offer some terms. But that doesn't make it fun, and in fact, it allows the flow of the episode to continue on. Meanwhile, if a combat begins with 12 threat on the board, it's something which could be really dangerous as opponents begin to call for reinforcements, as they make swift task spends, and they have momentum for themselves to avoid injury, which is something which only notable NPCs can do, but it is especially worrisome when they do so. So I hope that gives you a little bit of a walkthrough of this, a taste. If you have any questions, any thoughts about what should go in a future tactics video, then let me know. I'm the Complex Games Apologist. I hope you're having a great gaming summer.